Good morning, good evening, good everything in between, and welcome to the podcast, Interleague 2 Electric Boogaloo. I'm your host, Jim Obernicki, and I'm joined as always by Mr. Gabe Blarman. How you doing, Gabe? So glad there's Pacific League baseball to watch now that all six teams are back in their home stadiums for the entire week. If you're ever going to watch PLTV, this is the week. Watch PLTV. Absolutely. I am super jazzed to watch the Swallows against the Hawks tomorrow. That's going to be fantastic. And we are joined also by Mr. Michael Beely. How are you doing, Michael? Doing pretty pretty good, pretty tired. But uh, yeah, I'm also happy that we're back in the Pacific League parks. So I watched some of that this morning. That was That was good fun to see, especially that Rockton game that I'll get into. Yeah, man, the Eagles have been awesome, and we will get into that. But first, off the top rope, our May MVPs are here, and I'm going to cover both because they are both for my teams. On the pitching side, we got rookie sensation Natsuki Takeuchi from the Lions. Over this month, he had a 0.63 ERA over four starts with 20 strikeouts. It's the first time a rookie has won the monthly MVP since teammate Kona Takahashi won it as a rookie back in 2015. On, on that note, I'm really surprised Roki never won it. That is crazy, but that someone must have had a really good month <laughs> that Roki year. Roki may not have won it as a rookie. I'm positive he's won it a couple times as a sophomore or later. For sure, yeah. But I'm still surprised not as a rookie, but still, hey, Takeuchi's the real deal. And on the batter side, I mean, first time in his whole career, over a decade long, it's Hawks first baseman Ryoya Kurihara. In 21 games, he's been balling out this month, slashing 373, 444, and 672, leading the league in this month with 16 RBIs and nine doubles in uh, eight multi-hit games. And now I, 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 it's weird. I knew this happened, but I didn't. It was like one of those things where every time I checked the Hawks box score, I'd be like, "Oh, Yanagita did this. Uh, Yamakawa did that." I was like, "Why is Kurihara just going?" off like every game i'd be like oh that was a nice game from him but it was just every day this month so yeah good for him uh we missed this with the hawks clobbering the eagles but kurihara also almost had a cycle uh he got a double a homer and a single uh another homer and so picked up six rbis right now i do remember that when i looked at the stat line he he crushed the eagles personally and so yeah that's the may mvps and we've also got some other news uh regarding some broadcasty kind of related things mike what do you have for us on that yeah, uh, pretty interesting to see. So representatives from all 12 NPB teams will be heading to North America from June 17th to June 24th, where they will observe um, some MLB and minor league games and uh, discuss broadcasting rights, streaming services, and the data industry of Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball. And thanks to our new team member, Matt, for the translation of the uh, the article that was reporting on that. Yeah, that whole broadcast thing is pretty interesting. Um, I I don't think they're going to like be talking about broadcasting MPB games to America. At least I hope not, because then we lose our jobs. <laughs> I don't um, know. You know, maybe there's a market there for four savvy young men who know NPB, can speak English, and have broadcast experience, you know? True. Yeah, maybe, actually, yeah. Or we could be part of the team in some capacity, maybe help write copy. But yeah. Um, I think it's more on a technical level. I think they're just kind of going to go over technical specs of how they broadcast games because, you know, they, the MLB games do look great, and but the MPB also has its own really good presentation. So maybe they're just going to compare notes. That's what I think, at least. I'm curious about the data industry side. We know that advanced stats is one area where MPB has been lagging a little bit behind the majors. Maybe there's an opportunity for finally getting some StatCast related stuff coming over to PLTV so we could actually get exit scary. velocity for how hard Chusei Manami just scorched that home run. Yeah, or like what the uh, the launch angles on Yamakawa's bombs. <laughs> or the, the spin rate on Roki Sasaki's forkball. You know, that sort of stuff. Let we, us well, stat we do have those, do but it. I think only when they're playing at uh, Pepe Dome. <laughs> ah. Stop hogging the good stuff, SoftBank. Oh, well, yes, maybe that would be it. would be like, all right, you guys got to stop hogging it. You got to spread it around a little bit. <laughs> and speaking of Matt, actually, you're going to hear from him now. Not live with us, but he has a special message for you guys. Take a listen to this. 
Hey listeners, thanks for checking out the podcast. My name is Matthew Seibert. Feel free to call me Matt if you like. And I'm the newest member of the team working hard to increase the coverage of the Pacific League in English via the YouTube channel. Since this is the very first time any of the listeners are hearing my voice, I wanted to take just a moment to introduce myself. Several years ago, to tend to a sister city connection that's now over 30 years strong, I journeyed to Japan, living in Kumamoto Prefecture over five years. Despite the Hawks dynasty going on close by, I never actually took in an NPB game during that span. That time was a revelation for myself, particularly in earning enough skill with the Japanese language to test proficient at the second highest level of the Japanese language proficiency test. I'm honored to have earned that certificate, and I'm even more thrilled to use those Japanese skills to help translate news items and community posts into English for this channel. I also love the game of baseball, playing it for 11 years when I was still a young, fit athlete. I spent time at every position on the diamond, but mainly the outfield thanks to a strong throwing arm and great speed. Coming back to pour out my appreciation for the sport in this way feels so personal and distinct, and that will be a privilege. I have lots to learn about the league and its history, but I'm eager to learn from my new colleagues. In my day job, I teach private music lessons to make good use of the degrees I earned during my undergraduate years, so you might be hearing some of those talents come to life in support of PLTV English. Look forward to more on that soon. Additionally, I hope to feature somewhat regularly on the podcast, Midnight Matinees, and thank goodness they start before midnight in my time zone, and maybe start a new series on the channel doing game highlight packages and also pitching in on some farm league coverage. I'm ready for a fun new journey, and I want to thank the crew for being so welcoming to me already. As they say in Japan, for the start of nearly every venture, Yoroshiku onegaishimasu! And so that brings us to our Around the Horn segment, the main part of the show where we take a look at every team from top to bottom in the league and talk about how they're doing this week. And, of course, as always, we are starting with my Fukuoka Soft Bangkoks, 3-2 and two since we last spoke, 9-4 and four overall in the inner league, and felicitations to Cuban pitching sensation Levan Mornello, who got his first career hit at Yokohama Stadium on June 7th. It was an opposite field single, and I don't think he picked up an RBI, but I saw a lot of videos of him just looking so pleased to have hit that ball. It's, you know, it, it is the one thing I'll give the Central League. I do like, I like seeing pitchers hit. I prefer having a DH, but I also really like seeing pitchers hit. It's really nice. What you didn't see is that Moinello also struck out three times. That's fine. That's what the catcher <laughs> spot does anyway. The thing is, watching pitchers strike out is fun too, you know, <laughs> a little bit. I, I, lo I love watching pitchers bunt. Get it down, get it down. <laughs> But uh, so, but still speaking of Monello, he would pitch eight strong innings, striking out seven and allowing only a Tyler Austin home run. Um, but he still got the win, part for parcel of being a starter instead of the reliever. So he's doing great. He's having a fantastic season so far. Uh, he still sits second in the PL with an ERA of just 1.7. And uh, Kohi Arihara is just uh, behind him with an ERA of just two on the on the nose so the 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 hawks pitching has been doing fantastic and kensuke kondo man just if you go look at the stats he's basically leading every possible statistic for hitters right now he's batting 345 yeah, yeah on, on basis base. 444 and he's slugging 547 just oh so he's leading he's doing the triple crown right now he's killing it as far as slash line goes he is just in the form of his career at the moment I, of course, I miss Inagita, but Kondo is really picking up the slack. I wouldn't have expected Kondo's contract to be an underpay for what <laughs> he's been doing. But holy smokes, do the Hawks have a bargain with that free agent deal. I am just amazed with what Kensuke is doing. He is that man. He is that man. And that brings us over to our second place team in the Pacific League, the Chiba Lode Marines. Take it away, Mike. All right. So the Marines are five, six, and two in interleague. So pretty much just going steady at this point. Is not like that, uh, you know, that undefeated streak they were on right before interleague and carried a little bit into in uh interleague. Shunsuke Nakamori will be getting his first start of the season uh, tomorrow, as confirmed by the team on Twitter. Uh, he was actually pitching in the Australian Baseball League during the offseason that you can actually watch free on YouTube uh, during the winter. So uh, when there's no Pacific League content, you can always uh, go watch that. There will be some NPV guys in there. There usually is a few every year. Uh, so that, that's that's nice to see. Hopefully, um, hopefully he does well. 
And then uh, Roki Sasaki, uh, speaking of pitchers batting, Roki Sasaki had to bat with the bases loaded against Hiroshima the other day. That was interesting. He's been in the league for a while, and I really honestly don't remember know how he's... I don't think I've ever actually seen him at bat. Or even seen like a highlight of or even like a clip, like a Twitter thing going around. So I didn't see that game because it's not on PLTV, but I'm going to assume he probably struck out. That's or my favorite. Just, That's a safe assumption. Or probably just stood there <laughs> far, far away from the uh from the plate. Please don't plunk me. Please don't plunk me. Please, please, please. Uh, but um speaking of good pitching, the pitchers of the Marines are just amazing. CC Mercedes now leads the PL in ERA with 1.45. In 62 innings pitch over 10 starts. However, he is one and two because he just doesn't get any run support. And I feel like that's a problem that's been going on with him. I think even like last year, like he would have like a really good game and then they would just never score runs for him. I think if you go back and listen to some of the early podcasts from last year, you'll, you'll hear me saying the same thing. And uh, speaking of the pitchers, Sasaki sits third with uh, 196 and Tanichi sits 10th with a 2.62. And Ojima 13th with 429. So the Marines have a really good pitching staff. Just you, some of the, the offense is kind of interesting. You are absolutely right about this. this. is something we brought up last year. CC Mercedes in his first year with the Chibalote Marines picked up 10 no decisions with a 3.33 ERA. And then this year, seven no decisions with a 1.45 ERA. That's Poor so guy brutal. just can't catch a break. <laughs> Jeez, that is that's painful. And so that brings us over to our third place team, the Hokkaido Nippon Ham Fighters. Take it away, Gabe. Yeah, they've kind of dropped three in a row, getting shot in back-to-back games. Less than ideal. But because of the Marines' struggles lately, they're still tied for second place, just back on percentage points. Congratulations to Fighters starting pitcher Takayuki Kato for reaching 1,000 innings pitched. He got to the mark on June 9th at Meiji Jingu Stadium against the Swallows, pitching seven scoreless innings with four strikeouts and, of course, no walks. He is the control freak after all. And I miss this in part because he must have just qualified for the batting title recently, but fighters catcher Yua Tamiya is second in the batting race behind Kensuke Kondo, slashing 340, 400, 468 with two homers and 10 doubles. I was not expecting Tamiya to do big things, but you remember he had a triple in our first midnight matinee and maybe we were ahead of the curve on his talent. So I'm keeping an eye on this. Another big bat to go with Manami, Kiyomiya, Go Matsumoto, Ariel Martinez. Yes, I like this. Yeah, he's actually, he got my vote for a Pacific League catcher for the All-Star voting, which we will cover, I think, next week. But yeah, he's been having one hell of a season. And that brings us over to our fourth place team, the Tohoku Rakuten Golden Eagles. Take it away, Mike. All right, so the Eagles, uh, 3-1 and one since we last saw them. Now 10-3 and three in interleague and only three back of the Marines and fighters uh, in their bid for a playoff spot. So they've been having a very good interleague, probably really enjoying the... Uh, the time away from the Pacific League teams that are have been beating up on them all year. Uh, Yuya Ogo took advantage of a Alberto Baldonado meltdown today in Sendai as the Giants closer issued three walks and two hits to blow a two-run lead. And that was a pretty crazy game. The uh, Giants at one point even in the third inning to go back-to-back off um, Cody Ponce. So that was... I, I saw that uh, earlier this morning when I was watching. But uh, the Eagles won that one on that walk-off, 7-6. Ogo himself now sits fifth in the batting title race with his fellow outfielder, uh, Josuke Tatsumi, uh, right behind him. And Takahiro Norimoto finally allowed a couple of runs. His 14 saves is still second behind Osuna in the Pacific League, but he has a uh, better 0.86 ERA. Yeah, you know, I, I saw uh, Eagles fans saying online that they wish they could just play the Central League all year long. <laughs> like, I know we talked about catching up to Pacific League teams using interleague play, but like, man... The Eagles have been on fire since interleague started. The uh, Marines you know, I and Fighters have got to be to... looking over their shoulder. The Eagles are only three back now. Yeah, no, they're coming. I wonder if they're going to use it to take momentum to carry on through the season. Sort of like, remember last season when they changed the batting coach? This could be maybe something similar. Maybe they're finding their groove. 
And so that brings us over to our fifth place team, a team that is not finding the groove, the O-Ricks Buffaloes. Take it away, Gabe. Speak for yourself. They've won six games in a row. They swept the Giants oh. at their place and opened the Japan Series rematch against the Hanshin Tigers, slamming the door for nothing with Ryusei Soltani striking out 12 over six innings. Here comes Oryx. They're only one game back of the Eagles now. Part of that, of course, is pitching. Three more products from the Buffalo's pitching lab have emerged over the last weekend. Kazuma Sato won his NPB debut against the Giants on Sunday at Tokyo Dome, going five scoreless innings. He's the first Buffalo's pitcher to win his debut when starting from a development contract. The guy who got the start before then was Kyosuke Saito, still 19 years old, who pitched five scoreless innings and got his first career NPB win. You may remember him as the guy who took the no decision against the Eagles in the last midnight matinee because Hirano blew the save. You were there for that, Jimbo. Yes, yeah, I remember that. And finally, rookie reliever Seiryu Kotajima has started his career with 20 consecutive scoreless appearances. 19 innings, 15 strikeouts, 9 hits, 10 walks. So, whip of one, almost a K per nine. This Buffalo's team, man, you better be able to score like three runs because you ain't winning if you score fewer than that. I also noticed Andres Machado started to get some saves as a closer role. Told you he's he's that good. Yeah, honestly, yeah. yeah I apologize. I hadn't been paying attention to how well the um, the Buffaloes have been playing lately. But how do they keep developing pitchers? Like, like, please tell me the secret to their success. I don't know, but I know that they also can't develop hitters. <laughs> it, it's like it's like the barbarian who put all his points into strength, but none into charisma. <laughs> And um, speaking of teams now, now I'll tell you a team that hasn't found the groove. Now I'll tell you a team that is that is off. The Saitama Cebu Lions, you know, just when it kind of looked like they were kind of finding their footing, uh, they have totally, totally collapsed. I think they've gone uh, 0-5 since we last spoke. Um, I don't remember last time they won a game. Uh, they've got the rookie of the month. They've got the player of the month, the, the rookie sensation. But other than that, it's hard, hard goings for these Lions, as usual this year. But, you know, we'll try to be positive. Um, let's, you know, Takumi Kiriyama now has the most hits in interleague history. Uh, and interleague only started in 2005, so that kind of lapped over with his career. He picked up his 334th hit against the Carp uh, um, in today's game at the time of recording. And but you know it's uh, it's just like this is how the season's gone. You know they almost got no hit on Sunday, getting shut down by the Tigers at Koshian. It's the sixth shutout loss of the season and the second eight game losing streak in as many months. It's just man, it's brutal. Uh, interim manager Hassan Obuwatanabe is quoted by saying the opposing pitcher has a lot of room to maneuver on the mound. I bet it's it's because there's not a lot of hitting talent for the Lions right now. It's it's hard. At but, this point, um, just flush it. Yeah, Move on, <laughs> flush it, look to next year. Uh, outfielder Ko Koichi Okumura was called up to the big club on June 9th, but his jersey wasn't ready in time. So uh, he took the field wearing 132. Again, that's just, it just really feels like the Lions season. <laughs> You're like, oh, we don't even have the jersey for the hitters. Like, hey, <laughs> uh, For context, players on developmental contracts uh, who are beyond the 70 man organizational roster wear triple digit numbers some teams use a zero as the leading digit some use a one so that's why Okamu okumura was wearing 132 that's the number he used to wear under his developmental contract in the future he'll be wearing 75. well i mean that's still a high number <laughs> but it's not, not a not in the hundreds that's that's progress <laughs> And so we're uh, we're going to close it today's show with our familiar faces in new places. How are our boys doing stateside? Aside from being a really good pitcher lately, Yusei Kikuchi uh, was having dinner with fellow Japanese player Rintaro Sasaki when uh, visiting Oakland and the Bay Area with the Blue Jays on the road. He tweeted about it uh, yesterday. Yusei Kikuchi said that Rintaro Sasaki has such a solid way of thinking that it's hard to believe he's only 19 years old. So he didn't really teach him anything. What he did say is that the one English word he should never forget is priceless. 
You say says he would like to support his challenge with a long term and warm heart. So clearly there there's a burgeoning friendship there and and maybe a mentorship. And it's not like Rintaro Sasaki is not making a name for himself. He hit his first home run in uh, North America earlier tonight. Uh, he's playing with the Trenton Thunder in the N MLB Draft League. And Michael, I know you've been keeping an eye on Rintaro Sasaki. Are you surprised at all? No, not really. He just continued to do what, what he does, just smash baseballs. What is the Draft League? I've never heard of this. When they realigned the uh, minor leagues a couple years ago, some of the like former um, like single A and double A teams got reorganized, and now they have a le a wood bat league for college students and uh, prospects interested in entering the MLB draft. But I don't think they're draft eligible yet. Hmm. It's just to, like show off their uh, talent, I believe. Okay, well, that's an interesting thing. I read actually, I read a beautiful article about Sasaki. Um published in some sort of like a Stanford related sort of thing, really in depth, uh, had a really good interview with him. And yes, yeah, Sas Sasaki sounds like such a um, mature level headed 19 year old. It's crazy how much perspective he seems to have on things. And just like really, really seems to have his eye on the prize. And like, yeah, he's, I think he's going to be a superstar, man. And especially like, forget what we're talking about off the field, just watching him bat and batting practice. Oh my God. Like that dude crushes baseballs. Like, holy hell. The Japanese Prince Fielder, as someone on Twitter once called him. I think that's apt. I I mean, I love Prince Fielder, but I think he's going to be better than Prince Fielder. So, but, you know, peak Prince Fielder, here's the thing. I think he's going to peak Prince Fielder, but he's going to last a lot longer. Because you might forget, peak, peak Prince Fielder, mashed, man. That guy was a king. <laughs> I see what you did there with the joke. Nicely done. <laughs> you know what? I didn't even mean to do it. I saw The moment I said it, I was like, Really? <laughs> I didn't even mean to do that. <laughs> All right. And so that brings us to the end of the show and our question of the day from us to you and us to each other. If you were to have dinner with Rintaro Sasaki, where would you take him? Um, Gabe, do you have somewhere in mind while I mow my options over? I'm trying to think of something that's distinctly Torontonian because, I mean, yeah. he's he's got plenty of fill of his food back home. Oh, I got it. I got it. I take him to Holy Chuck Burgers, the best burgers in Toronto. Fight me, Burgers Priest. There's one right across the street from me. I only go like once every three months because otherwise my body would revolt against itself. <laughs> they do a burger that's marinated in chili oil with their own home pickled jalapenos on it. And it is just the right amount of spice. Mm. I think he'd love it. Well, you need, you need to take me there next time I come to Toronto. That sounds Hell fantastic. Yes. <laughs> uh, for me, I think I take him to Schwartz's Deli in Montreal. One of the best places to get a smoked meat sandwich, which is, which is very much a Montreal staple. And I really doubt he's ever had something like that in Japan. And then I would also take him somewhere to get a proper fresh wood oven bagel. We have the best bagels in the world. New York isn't even close. If anyone hears this and wants to fight me, I will fight you. It's not even a competition. I can't believe how right New York bagels are. Montreal has the best bagels in the world. And I would give one to Rintaro Sasaki. What okay, about you? So, uh, so I got to jump in here. Yes, on Schwartz's. I, I Every single time I've been to Japan, delicatessen is not a thing. And you don't have to use weasel words one of. It is the best smoked meat in the world. But for the bagels... Are you a Fairmont or a St. Viator family? Um, I find St. Viator really overrated. Um, Fairmont's okay, but like I like going to like like there's this bagel place in the West Island called Hansel and Bagel. It's oh oh to die for. I could buy I could eat a dozen of them fresh out the oven. They are so good. But between Fairmont and St. Viator, I've always found Viator very overrated. So yeah, I'm, that, I'm that's like Montague that. Capulet sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, for, no, totally. for those of you who are It's the same thing with, with the smoked meat thing. I, I know there's like other famous smoked meat places that I'm blanking on that might get mad at me, but Schwartz's is just really good. I don't really, I'm, I'm, I don't have much skin in the game on the smoked meat thing. Smoke meat, smoke meat, it's really good. <laughs> and what about you, Mike? I'm pretty sure you got you got to take him somewhere for a Philly cheese stick. Am I right? <laughs> uh, I hate cheese sticks actually, but um... well, you're wrong. My God, get out of your own city. Gladly, you want to trade? I will trade you. I I might. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that off air. I have some dental problems. I need some free dental right now. Okay, buddy, we can switch. We don't have free dental. Oh, okay. Never mind. You're useless to me. <laughs> <laughs>
he wants to play in America, then we're going to have to go to a Denny's after midnight, <laughs> preferably near like a Walmart, near one of those like bootleg corner stores that used to be like a 7-Eleven, but 7-Eleven left near a check cashing place. Sun's never out. Yeah, that's where he's going. Why don't you take him to one of your local pizzerias who you, what do you love think I just so, described? so much? <laughs> They're all located in that area anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that's well, where we're going. Maybe <laughs> Cracker Barrel if, uh, if he's show. nice oh, to me. Or does it? Wait a minute. I'm th I'm thinking here. Do you have any Waffle Houses in uh, Philadelphia? Not here. There are some in Pennsylvania, but they're all in like the upper part, like kind of like the Pittsburgh area. And then when you get way up there, you run into Eat and Park, which is like the Waffle House bootleg. Okay, I'm just thinking that is a cultural experience. It is admittedly one that you can only experience in the southern United States. And if he's sent down to, like, certain double or triple-A leagues, he will eventually run into it. I mean, if he wants to go there, we can. This is going to it's gonna be a bit of a road trip. He gets to see all sorts of things if uh, we go there. All sorts of things? Like northern Pennsylvania? Like what? <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't, you don't, you don't want to know what happens at Waffle House. Oh, no. I've heard, I've heard about what happens at Waffle House. That's actually why I want to go to a Waffle House. I don't <laughs> want the Waffle House. I want the, I want the theater. <laughs> the theater? <laughs> Broadway's got nothing on it. <laughs> but that brings us to the end of today's show. Thank you ever so much for listening. And also, tell us where you would take Rintaro Sasaki. I'm very interested in seeing what your comments are because I know we've got a lot of fans all over the world and you must have a lot of really interesting places to eat. But please like, comment, and subscribe. Do all that YouTube stuff. And we'll see you next time on the podcast. Take care. <laughs>